We ready, brother? Red light. All right. That means go, and we thank the Lord for you being here. I appreciate the Lord and His blessings. Uh, I'd ask you to remember Pastor Hayworth. Uh, they're traveling, I think, this week, and I appreciate him. And he's asked me to uh, to fill in, and I'm I'm a um, a weak replacement for Brother Brady. I've uh, been looking uh, at the book of Nehemiah, and if you have your Bible, let's open it there tonight. And uh, just want to be a help to you, and hope and pray that that we can glean uh, from the Word of God. Boy, I appreciate uh, the Word of God. I, I love to study the Bible, and I hope that you do as well. And uh, the book of Nehemiah is one more book. A lot of things we can learn uh, from the book of Nehemiah. And last week, uh, Pastor Hayworth, Dr. Hayworth, focused on the subject of rejecting opposition. And can I say to you, if you're in the Lord's work, you better be well set on the thought about opposition. There's always going to be opposition to the Lord's work, it will come, it always does. You might want to write that down somewhere. There are problems that are certain to arise as sure as the sun is going to rise in the east in the morning. You just rest assured that opposition is going to come against the Lord's work. Tonight we continue to discuss how a leader should react or respond when opposition arises. And before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His help tonight. For without Him, we can do nothing. The enemy would like to stop this tonight because he doesn't want us to know about <coughs> opposition. Brother Mark, that's you praying for us. Yes. 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 Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark, and we appreciate that. Again, we hope and pray that all of you had uh, wonderful Resurrection Sunday services. We thank the Lord uh, for all that's been and done and said over the last day or two, and we thank God for a risen Savior, empty tomb, and I'm glad for that this evening. Again tonight, as we begin our study this evening from the book of Nehemiah, uh, we want to continue to discuss how you, as a leader, should react when that opposition does arise. And it's going to, just bank on it. And a real leader not only rejects opposition, but a real leader will respond to opposition. And we're going to look at two principles tonight, and it's found uh, in chapter number 4, uh, the first one in verse 19 down through 23, as we notice the principle of resolute harmony. Now, I like that. That's a big phrase and a big word. And what it means, it means unity in the camp. Man, we need unity in the church house the hour in which we live. And we should do everything that we can to keep the unity in the house of God. And then secondly tonight, we're going to be looking at the second thought. And there's only two thoughts tonight. And if we can get through these real quick, it'll be in chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 13, the problem of reoccurring havoc. Uh, in other words, not only is there unity in the camp, but there can be an undermining in the camp. All right, let's look at the first principle tonight. And, and God wants us to be great leaders. And I'm going to be honest with you. We're looking at a nation that needs a leadership. There's a leadership problem in America, all throughout America. And let me just say it this way. There's also leadership problems in the churches throughout the world, not only in America, but throughout the world. And, and what the world needs is a strong leader. And uh, God wants to use you, if you'll, if, he, if you'll allow Him to, to be a strong leader in the house of God. And I like the unity in the camp, don't you? I like unity rather than uh, the Tony Malay style of union, uh, throwing the cat, tying their tails together, throwing them across the clothesline. He ought to be ashamed of himself. And uh, he, ought to, he ought to pay for that crime, amen. 
and somebody needs to report him. Uh, how long has that been, Tony, since you did that? Many years ago, no doubt. But nevertheless, they had union, but they didn't have unity. Unity is something that is necessary to be successful in the house of God. Nehemiah is watching as, and as well as expecting the enemy's attack. And I want to say this. You need to help your pastor. You need to be supportive of him, of the man of God. And if you are a pastor, you need to be watching for the enemy's attack. And when it comes, you can just expect it. And oftentimes it is. It will be an attack on the unity in the house of God. Uh, a good pastor will, and just as Nehemiah, he wisely realizes that another way the enemy attacks the work of God is to get those working for God to become disharmonized with one another. And when that happens, the work of God automatically comes to an abrupt halt. Can two walk together except they be agreed? I'm going to be honest with you. That's right. They can and neither will two walk together unless they have that unity in the house of God. There needs to be unity in the camp of the Lord. And first of all, number one, Nehemiah warned the people of lacking unity. If you'll notice in verse number 19 in your Bible, book of Nehemiah 4.19, the Bible says, And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separate, separated upon the wall, one far from another. And I want to say this, when we're not close together in unity and working hand in hand, it, it leaves a lot of open gaps. It leaves a lot of places, holes for the enemy just to easily walk through. But boy, when we're standing in unity, hand in hand, arm in arm, I want to tell you, it's amazing to see what God can do with His people if we'll just realize that we need to understand there is a lacking of unity oftentimes. Uh, I notice in this verse, uh, he called, his call was to the whole. In other words, to everybody. It was specific. And it was to all the workers, to the nobles, to the rulers, and everyone. And I want to say this tonight. Sometimes we as men of God need to stand up and say, hey, we need to be in unity as a church. And I will say this, sometimes you as a pastor will know that the church is not in unity. And you can feel that. You may not have a clue what it is. You may not even ever understand what it is. But you know from the revealing of the Holy Spirit that there's not unity in the camp. And I want to say this, it is a terrible feeling when the pastor gets that. Because he knows there's something going on that's, that's tearing the church apart. And so it is a call to the whole of the body. But not only was his call to the whole, but his call was to warn. And it warned of separation. In that verse, he talks about separation. Yes, they were working, but yes, they were divided. Did you know you can be working for the Lord in the church house and you can be divided? And I've seen it happen. You have one little group pitted another against them. They may be good people. And how, how some of you nodding your head, you know exactly what I, I'm seeing. I'm seeing uh, people in my mind I'm thinking about over the years of ministry. I, I'll just say this. If any of our people are watching this, it would never be any from Bethel Baptist Church. Amen. I'm thinking about other churches that I've been in. Amen. <laughs> but I'm just being honest. If you pastored any length of time, you're going to see that stuff. And I want to say this. Clicks will do more damage than they do good in the house of God. I don't read in the Bible where these clicks. Amen. The only click is a pick. Amen. Right here. You click that, and that's all right. I've got it twisted around my hand. Now, how in the world I did that? Well, that's a new one, Brother Tony, on me. But nevertheless, I'm glad that the call was to warn of separation. What is uh, what is the common bond that joins to the work we do? It is the Holy Spirit of God. And I'm going to say this. The Holy Spirit of God has feelings. I hope you believe that tonight. He has feelings. And did you know that disunity, it causes Him to grieve? And I'll say this. You're talking about rough singing. When the choir gets up to sing, if there's disunity in the camp, it's hard for the choir. To sing in the Spirit of God. It's hard for the Sunday school teacher. To stand up in the Spirit of God. And teach the Word of God. And I found it extremely difficult. From time to time. 
to preach the Word of God when the Holy Ghost has been quenched by disunity. And I'm going to say this. We need to warn our people about this thing of separation. Amen. We are called to be one. And I, you, some of y'all, some of y'all married, you know what it, you know what it means, amen, to get a cold shoulder. You know how that, you can just come in, you can feel it maybe a little bit in the house. You've done something and, and maybe you're not ready to admit it. You get a little cold shoulder on that, or maybe that, that, that you give cold shoulder, amen. There's more men in here than there are women, but I want to say this. We need to be cautious about that because that's not going to do us any good like that and neither does it does do any good for the house of God to be that way but if we're not careful our spiritual life can be put on the back burner when we get so busy even doing the work of God those people were busy building the wall and even at that they were busy but the work of God I want to say this is most important and you and I can get so busy and we're doing the things of God and we're doing this but we need unity our spiritual life is most important. We find that out. You might need to know that. Question four. I'm better than Brother Hayworth about telling you the answers. Amen. I want you to get a good grade. Amen. I want you to be on the dean's list. And that's Brother Tony's prayer list. He's praying for you. Amen. He's the dean. So as we're thinking about that, we can become so busy, neglect our lives and our relationship with God. Can I say three words? Three three little words? Caution, caution, caution. You need to be cautious about that. Can I ask you a question tonight? How's your prayer life? Have you prayed today? Have you prayed for your church today? Have you prayed for your pastor today? Have you prayed for the moving of God tomorrow? I wonder, hey man, I wonder how many preachers are already. We're more worried about the sermon that we're going to preach than asking for the Holy Ghost to show up and move. In the, in the, I will tell you, the Holy... Hey, hey, I've tried it, buddy. I've had the best little outline. I've had five points and a poem. And boy, I tell you what, I poured the sugar on it. Amen. I mean, it was just as sweet as candy. I mean, you can about eat the paper. That's how sweet that message is. And you get up to preach and there ain't no Holy Ghost on it. Let me just tell you something, buddy. You can have the best message ever and not have the moving of God. I believe the Lord Jesus said it himself. Without me, ye can do nothing. As we're thinking tonight, I want to caution you and I about our prayer life. And then how's your Bible reading? Amen. We're not, we supposed to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I need to read more in the Word. I try every day, Brother Tony. I am in the Word of God and I try to invest myself in the Word of God, but I guess I could cut off the Long Ranger, especially about the time I watched the fourth episode. I know already who's going to win. Y'all ain't hearing me tonight. I already know who's going to win. It doesn't matter, amen. And about the fourth episode, I'm thinking, I need to read my Bible instead of watching this. I already know how the outcome's going to be. They're going to have a fight, and the Lone Ranger's going to knock somebody out or shoot somebody. There ain't going to be no blood. Somebody say amen right there. And then and then he's going to win at the end, and they're going to stand there and watch him ride off and say, who was that masked man? That was the Lone Ranger. I know the plot, amen. And boy, I tell you what, but that sometimes can waste our time, and when we we need to be praying and when we need to be reading our Bible, there are two absolutely essentials for your spiritual life. If you're going to be in harmony and the church is going to be in harmony, we need to believe this book and we need to be in the Word of God. That's why it's very important that the entire body of believers read and pray. And if we read and pray, we'll see what God can do. Uh, in the lesson tonight, it's right here in black and white. I'm just going to say this. How's your church attend? Are you faithful to the house of God? I'm talking about all services. I'm talking about revival meetings and special special times. I want to tell you, if you want to walk with God, you want to work for God, I want to tell you, if you want unity in the house of God, you show up, you read your Bible, you pray, and you come to the house of God, you'll see God do great things. When God's people get together, God said, where two or three are gathered together, I will be in the midst. I'm glad tonight that He's in the house this evening. 
Church right here with us tonight in Bible College. I want to say that I'm glad of that. Nehemiah warned the people of lacking unity. But Nehemiah, he goes on in Amos 3.3. 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Right there's the verse. And if we can't walk together, how can we ever work together? Well, I'll tell you what, I don't like so-and-so because they're untrustworthy. They, they're they undependable. They I, I want to say this, you may not like them, but you're supposed to love them. Amen. Yeah, and boy, I want to tell you, love will cover a multitude of sins. Somebody shout right there. I want to tell you, glory to God, don't tell me you love so, you don't like somebody that you're in the house of God with. Don't tell me that. I don't want to hear it because it tells me that your heart is not right with God. Can I say it? We don't like their ways but we love them. And you know what old Abraham Lincoln, whether you like him or not, he made a statement one time. He said, I don't like that man. I need to get to know him better. Wouldn't it be something if the pastor only knew who you didn't like in the house of God and called a fellowship and give a signed seats? I'd do it if I knew it. Amen. Boy, that's a great idea. Amen. Just give a signed seats. Amen. At the fellowship. We all like to eat. Amen. And boy, I'm telling you, that'd be good and we need to do that. But if we can't walk together, how can we work together? And let me say this, it is the tactic of Satan to get you so busy that your spiritual life begins to suffer. If you don't read your Bible, if you don't pray, and you don't attend the services, I want to say this, you're not going to be what God would have you to be. Well, I'm telling you, we're moving right along with this principle of resolute harmony unity in the camp. Nehemiah warned the people of lacking unity. But secondly tonight, Nehemiah le wisely leads the people to unity. Look in verse number 20. In your Bible, chapter number 4, there's three great things that Nehemiah did to bring the people to unity. First of all, we're going to see uh, these three things. And first of all, he called, number one, for a sounding alarm. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse number 20, it says, In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. Can I say it this way? What we need is somebody to say, Hey, we're lacking in unity. We need to sound the alarm. And what they would do, they'd blow the shofar. And that was a big horn and a trumpet. And they used them in Israel even to this day. And if you look up in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word trumpet, it is that very word shofar in the Word of God. I thank God for the trumpet. That is going to sound one day after a while. But I want to say this. While you and I are here tonight. Somebody needs to sound the alarm. When there's not unity in the house of God. Who's that supposed to be? Well it should be the pastor. Amen. But not only as a sounding alarm. But he commanded a strong attention. Look in your Bible in verse 21. So we labored in the work. And half of them held the spears. From the rising of the morning. Till the stars appeared. We need some men and women in the hour in which we live that are willing to do the work of God. Now, I want to say this. If there's ever been a time that we need soldiers in God's army, if we need workers in the Lord's vineyard, it is the hour in which we live. I want to say this. I believe the work of God is carrying on in the hour in which we live, but not in the magnitude that it could be. I want to say this, and I'm not being critical, but on visitation, it's very difficult to get people to come out to visitation. It's very difficult to get them to go soul winning. It's very difficult to get people to hand out tracts. Is that because we got other things that envelop our time? And if we read our Bible, if we pray, and we attend the house of God, we'll get the idea that we need to give strong attention to the work of the Lord. I want to tell you can God trust you with His work? And I asked myself that question this evening. Not only he called for a sounding alarm and a strong attention, but thirdly, he completed a steady atten attendance. Notice this in verse number 22. Likewise, at the same time, said I to the people, let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. And so it is in verse 23. So neither I nor my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard which follow me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. Can I say this? 
We need some people today that are just sold out. Now, I'm not for you wearing the same clothes every day. Amen. I'm I'm for changing. Amen. At least your t-shirt. Amen. And your socks, amen. I'm I'm for that, and and I think you should. But but here it is. They some people that said we're going to be committed to this thing. We're going to be ready to go for God at any moment, amen. And I like that, don't you? And he, uh, wisely led the people to unity. And then we see not only the principle of resolute harmony. He warned the people of lacking unity. He wisely led the people unity. But the second point tonight, I ain't got but two. Somebody shout. And this is not going out on the internet because the internet died. We're recording it. So Pastor Hayworth won't know what time you get out of class tonight. Amen. Unless you tell him. And Brother Justin, don't tell him, please. I don't want him to worry. I don't want him to get an upset stomach over it and have to take an Al- Alka-Seltzer and all of that because you got out of class early. But I want to get you out of class early tonight. And I want to give you this. The problem of reoccurring havoc, undermining in the camp. Now, I want to say this tonight. I could preach a while right here. Isn't it amazing? I, I want to tell you, nine times out of every eight, when there's problems and it's somebody undermining in the camp, I can put my finger on it on it within five people. I can do it. And it's usually that way. You say, who are they? Well, you see me after class and give me $5 a piece and I'll tell you the five. And I'll be $5 richer tonight. Amen. I'll make up the names as two. I won't tell you the truth. And they, just a fake name. Amen. I'll give you. But nevertheless, there is undermining that goes on. And Nehemiah had already handled problems without the camp. You'll remember he took care of the enemies. And then the problems within the camp, Judah. But you would think that problems would cease. But that's wrong. Problems are always reoccurring. And often they bring havoc with them. And those who were, who were working on the wall were made up of nobles, of rulers, and common folks. And as they were working, the common folks were not able to go to their regular place of employment. They had There had been a drought, and as it is certain, there was a price increase as food is, in food as well, just as it's been in America over the last 18 months. Somebody shout right there. Have you seen any price increases? Hey Amen. We had a Wednesday night meal last Wednesday night. And one year ago, we had the same meal. And the price is exactly doubled in one year. Isn't that amazing? Their taxes and their other payments, such as their house payments, were past due. And they didn't have the money to make the payments. And to make matters worse, those in authority would not show any mercy toward them. In fact, they took their children as slaves because of the debts and foreclosed on their homes. And Nehemiah had to stop what he was doing and call a meeting with those people to warn them and to deal with unfair practices against the people. Can I say this tonight? What was Nehemiah's number one focus? What was the goal? It was to get what built? The wall. Can I say this tonight? I'd like to preach tonight on the subject. The walls of America have been broken down. And if it would be up to you and I as the church of the living God, if we ever do anything, we're going to have to work together in the church house to rebuild the walls that the devil has torn down over the last 75 years in America. We need some walls of spirituality. We need some walls of old-fashioned preaching. We need some walls built back up with old-fashioned praise and adoration unto the God of heaven. I want to tell you tonight, we're living in a terrible time. And I realize that. But Nehemiah had to deal with all these other little petty issues. And he dealt with them. But his primary objective was to rebuild the wall. Why was it? Because Jerusalem lay in waste and they were in peril. And they They were in danger of being attacked. Can I tell you tonight? Our families are in danger. Because the walls have been torn down. And we need some people. Who would get together in Bible reading. In Bible prayer. And praising God. And being thankful to the house of God. And coming together in unity. One with another. And loving God first and foremost. And revival once again might fall. That revival might come. That America might have revival. That the spiritual walls 
would once again be rebuilt. That we would get our focus on the off the petty stuff. We're too busy bickering and fussing and feuding over these silly things. And the Nehemiahs of our day, they're not building the wall. They're babysitting the people. Hallelujah. We need revival. We need a moving of God with the power of God. We're not going to have it when we miss the mark of rebuilding the wall. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, boy, we need a wall building in the hour in which we live. He had to stop what he was doing and call a meeting, Brother Richard, to deal with the practices against the people. The problem of reoccurring havoc. I'm almost done. Somebody shout right there. Ne- ne- I thought I heard one. <laughs> Nehemiah wisely responds to these real complaints. Look in chapter number 5. Let's read the first five verses. And there was a great cry of the people of their wives against their brethren the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that they may eat and live. Some also there were that said, Well, we we have not mortgaged, we have mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, and our houses. We might buy corn because of the dearth. And there were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. Verse number five, now yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and lo we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already, and neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I tell you, that's a sad story. Nehemiah, my, he, he hears their complaints and he realizes, first of all, that what they're telling him is true. What they're telling him is valid. And there are times when we think that there's validity, that it's valid to the complaints that we hear as well. There are times when we need to understand that what we're hearing is the truth. I will tell you, we need to listen when people complain. We need to hear what they say and get an understanding of it. And when real complaints are valid, a real leader, what does he do? Does he just set it to the side and say, well, somebody else will deal with that? No. He begins to get to work to find out what the details of the problems are as well as what to do about them. And I want to say this tonight. If you're going to be a real leader, you're going to have to learn to deal with problems and not just push them to the side and shove them away. You're going to have to deal with them one by one by one and a real leader leader will do that very thing. They had lost their homes. They had lost their vineyards. And they had no way to buy them back. Who wicked had taken advantage of the poor. And then we see secondly this evening. And boy this is the last point. Somebody shout right there. Brother Tony how are we on the time? We've been running along probably about 25 minutes or so. Oh hallelujah. You're going to get home early tonight. Somebody ought to really shout right there. Amen. So that Pastor Hayworth will know it was y'all that put me up to letting you out early. Give me a good hallelujah, Brother Mark. Thank you, Brother Mark. That was Brother Mark. He shouted right there, Pastor Hayworth. The problem of reoccurring habit. Not only Nehemiah wisely responded to those real complaints, but Nehemiah wisely rebuked those who were responsible. Now, he got a little angry altitude. Let's just put it that way. In verse number 6, notice what he said. And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. I want to say this. There's some times that we should get angry. There's some times that we should get tore up. But get, be right when you do. I mean, be angry over the right things. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down. What does that mean? It means go handle the problem. It doesn't mean to just take it in and, and go tell it to your wife and let her tell a half a dozen other people. You don't have to gossip it through the community. You need to handle it right then and right there. When it, you get angry and you've got an attitude of angry. He, he said, I, I, it made me angry when I heard the cry in these words. And then he got an at, at, attitude alteration. But then in verse number 7, look what he said. Then I consulted with myself. I want to say this, glory to God. Sometimes we need to just talk to ourselves. I do it all the time. Don't you? I say to myself, self. Come on now, don't, don't look up here so smart. And if you ain't old enough to do that, you will if you live long enough. Sometimes I walk into the bedroom and I say, Self, why did you come in here? Self, what was you looking for? 
What was you doing? What, what, what item was you looking for? You know what? But Nehemiah, in verse number 7, he said, Then I consulted with myself. Why in the world would you consult with yourself? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God the Holy Ghost lives within you. And I believe that God will lead you right. The Bible says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and then he can Google it and get the right idea. No, sir. If you ask God for wisdom, the Holy Spirit that lives within you will give you wisdom and we can consult with ourselves. I want to say this, a real leader sometimes has to consult with himself. And then the Bible says in verse number 7 again, he gave an authoritative announcement. And, and I like this. Nehemiah, I want to shake his hand when I get to heaven. Boy, I want to tell you, he was much of a leader. He was much of a man. He took time to think and then he brought it to the public. What did he say? Then I consulted with myself. Look at verse 7 of chapter 5. And I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said, hey, hey, he was rebuking them money men. He was rebuking them ones that had the power. He was rebuking them for their wrong. And he had the rights to do it because he was God's man. And he was the God anointed leader. He had a work to do. He knew that he had to do it. I look at that verse and I marvel at it. I rebuke the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I have said a great assembly against them. You're acting like a pawnbroker. You're taking property as security. You're receiving their children as slaves. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you low down rascals. I will tell you, glory to God, that's exactly what Nehemiah did. And he didn't do it behind a bushel basket. He didn't have a private meeting with them in the corner. He did it publicly. And then if you look in verse number 8, and he not only did it, brought it publicly, but he brought it pointedly. In verse number 8 of Nehemiah 5, and I said unto them, we after our ability have redeemed our brethren the Jews which have were sold into the heathen, and will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? They Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. Nehemiah brought it so plain and so pointed to them and it cut them to the bone and they were dirty dog guilty and they knew it. They were stinking guilty and they were rotten guilty and boy he called it out just like it was. Sometimes a man of God needs to just pull up his bridge boot legs and his britches. Hey man. And boy I want to tell you I like to tell some people to pull up their britches. Hey man I was thinking about that the other day. Driving along. There's a guy walking and his britches on the back end was down down to his knees. And I'm thinking, I want to roll my window down and say, pull up your britches. Hallelujah. That's exactly what Nehemiah did. He pulled up his... I'm thinking about buying suspenders and throwing at them guys. Amen? I mean, that looks stupid in my opinion. I mean, they can't even walk right. I mean, their britches down at their knees. It looked like to me if they tripped, they stepped on a pebble, they'd roll for a mile because they couldn't catch themselves. But Nehemiah brought it up. Boy, I'm, I'm pretty critical tonight, aren't I? Amen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I offended you from wearing your britches down like that. But if I see one of you out like that, I will holler. Pull up your britches. Amen. Brother Justin would do it, wouldn't you, Brother Justin? Amen. He brought it publicly. He brought it pointedly. He brought it personally. Look in verse number 9. Also, I said, it is not good that you do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? You know what? He told them that they were guilty and they were busted and then he shamed them for their guilt. And you know what? I mean, he, he was a leader. Man, he was a leader. So he responded to the real complaints. He rebuked those responsible. Lastly tonight, Nehemiah wisely requires restoration. Verse number 20, if you will notice it. Or question 20, 20, that's what it is. He required the wrong made right. And that's what real leaders do. That's what real leaders do. They just require the wrong made right. Verse number 10 of Nehemiah 5. I likewise, my brethren, my servants, might exact of them money and corn, I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses. 
also the hundred part of the money and of the corn and the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore thee and will require nothing of them, so we will do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and I took oath of them that they should do according to this promise. You know what? He also, not only did he, did he require the wrong made right, but he also reminded them of God's judgment. If you look in verse number 13, Also I shook my lap and said, So God, shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. Boy, that's a good verse right there. Amen. Also I shook my lap and said, So God, shake out every man from his house, from his labor, that performeth not this promise. Even thus be he shaken out and empty. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did according to this promise. Can I say it this way? Real leader always seeks harmony, but he does not run when havoc hits. Don't run. You know, I've seen too many preachers. <laughs> Time for me to go. Time for me to leave. I'm hitting the trail and they're gone. All the congregation said amen and praise the Lord and all the people did according to the promise. A real leader responds to real complaints. A real leader rebukes those responsible and a real leader requires restoration. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for a man by the name of Nehemiah. God, that was Your servant. Lord, had a burden. He was the king's cupbearer. And Lord, he had a cushy job. Lord, he could have stayed there where he was and, and just been that king's cupbearer. And Lord, not even have went to Jerusalem. But Lord, he got a burden that was bigger than him. And he had a desire to go. And I believe you put it there. And Lord, even though the work, Lord, was a lot to do, Lord, there was a work that worked against him. And Lord, he was willing and able to stand. And he had wisdom, Lord, to stand. And Lord, help us, Lord, as leaders. Lord, these seated in this class tonight, no doubt, Lord, some of them will become leaders, great leaders in the work of the Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you would use them. Lord, give them grace, give them wisdom. Lord, help them to have tact. Lord, help them to know when to speak and know when to be silent. Lord, help them to be fair in their judgments. Lord, I pray that you would help us all. God, for these principles, not only apply to the church house, but Lord, they also apply to our families as well. Lord, let us be fair. Let us be the leaders of our home. God, the way that you'd have us to be. And Lord, let us be about your business in these days for the walls of America are torn down. And Lord, it's up to us to build the wall. And we need unity to do that. Help us now. Thank you again for this night. Ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Are you glad you're